no one really cares about second place. And to the champion goes all of the glory. If you win on Sunday, you sell on Monday. This is the mantra that entire brands have been built upon. Lotus, Ferrari, McLaren. Even Ford revitalized its entire image by smacking down the prancing horse with the GT40. Mazda became the pride of Japan when its 787B screamed across the finish line of Le Mans. You wear Nikes because LeBron does. You drink Red Bull because Max Verstappen says so. And in the early 90s, you bought a Skyline GTR because it didn't fucking lose. Today, the R32 GTR is a balanced, fun little sports car. Capable, understated, and full of potential. In the 1990s, it was unstoppable. In racing form, the R32 GTR obliterated anything it faced. Its performance was so dominating, so monolithic, that it sent everyone back to the drawing board. It changed the rules. The third generation GTR saved a struggling Japanese company and catapulted them into one of the most respected names in the sports car universe. All thanks to a top secret project known only as 901. Nissan created a monster. Its name was Godzilla. And this is how it was born. Look, I'm not going to start at the beginning. You've already heard that story. There was a war crime, there was a merger, then came the Skylines, then there were GTRs, and then there wasn't anything for a while. I know Skyline. No. Today, our story begins in 1984. You see, Nissan was struggling. They were floundering. They couldn't sell cars and they couldn't win races. The Nissan Z had become bloated and boring. The Skyline hadn't been worthy of the GTR badge in a decade. All new Nissan Skyline, purely for the pleasure of driving. The gas crisis of the 70s had changed Nissan, and not for the better. Enter Yutaka Kume, taking over as president of Nissan Motors in 1985. Kume takes the company by storm. You see, Nissan was buried in bureaucracy. Kume directs his people to remember the customers, to stop making boxy, boring cars. And he plans to lead with what is known as a spirit of hunger. Most companies in dire situations go the easy route. They start cutting costs, they build more mass appeal cars, <coughs> Porsche. And usually they get out of costly enterprises like racing. But Kume wanted Nissan to double down. He knew that for Nissan to be truly successful, they needed to raise their reputation on the world stage. And there is no better way to do that than to win. Kume and Nissan form a company-wide initiative known as the 901 Movement. Its goal is to create the number one best performing cars in the world by 1990. This is the moment that changes Nissan's history forever. I know, the skyline is terrific. You see, in 1984, Nissan's performance division, Nismo, was born. And so was I. It was a pretty good year. Yasuharu Namba is given the task of leading Nissan's new performance division. He had been driving and testing Nissan race cars since 1958. And under his guidance, Nismo entered touring car racing in 1985 with a serious intent to win. Their target was the All Japan Touring Car Championship. Despite its name, it was actually a global competition that took place in Japan. So Ford, BMW, Ferrari, Porsche all came to compete with Japan's best. And for a long time, Nissan was Japan's best. Nissan dominated the series with the C10 GTR back in the 60s. And in the 70s, they fought hard against Porsche, BMW, and Ferrari in Group 5, championing the insane super silhouette skyline. And then, in 1985, the series was reborn with Group A. Group A, for those that are uninformed, is related to Group B. You know, those wild rally racing monsters everybody loves? 
You see, the FIA organization has specific classes or groups for racing cars, on or off-road. Group B was the more unlimited class, and Group A had tighter restrictions. They were cars that closely resembled the ones consumers could buy from dealerships. They had limited modifications, factory body panels, which means that they were a far more effective sales tool for Nissan. If racing fans could see a car that they could actually buy winning races, and it was defeating global superpowers like Ford and BMW, they would sell those cars. That is, if they could win. And in the missing 600,000k enduro, Skyline went all the way to prove that it really is the winning Aussie 6. Mmm, very nice. Very. And you see, that was the problem. At the time, the GTR name was all but a distant memory for Nissan. The Nissan DR30 Skyline had been successful in the Group 5 racing series, but Group A meant it had to come in largely stock form. So gone were all the wild aero parts, and the DR30 could not keep pace. In the 1985 season, it struggled to compete with the BMW 6 Series, Honda Civic Si, the Turbo Volvos, and even the Levin Corollas. Then, in 1986, Nissan debuted the DR31, the first RB-powered Skyline. It was boxy, it wasn't very inspiring, and today it's pretty much all but forgotten. But it did take home the top spot in its very first race of the JTCC. And thanks to some weird scoring structures in the series, it won the overall championship in 1986. The team at Nissan starts to feel the electricity of victory. But that moment is short-lived. As the years go on, the series gains popularity and competition heats up. More international manufacturers start joining the fray. The E30 BMW M3 is released upon the tracks of Japan. Ford fields the Sierra and begins to win races. The podiums of this Japanese championship begin to be almost completely dominated by foreigners. Nissan's grasp on the top spot begins to weaken. Japan as a whole starts to take a back seat in its own championship. To truly dominate Group A, Nissan knew they needed a new car. And for that, the 901 movement needs to show the world what Nissan is truly capable of. Nissan technology versus the bottom line. Thanks to the efforts of the 901 project and Kume's leadership, mid-80s Nissan was a technology powerhouse. And it culminated with the reveal of the Nissan Mid-4, Nissan's ambitious take on the word supercar, a mid-engined wedge-shaped sports car that might make some fans of the NSX question if maybe Honda copied some of their homework off of Nissan in the 80s. While it is a crime against humanity that the Mid-4 and the Mid-4 II never made it into production, as a result of its development, Nissan had a proper all-wheel drive system to implement into its new Halo car. They even had a revolutionary four-wheel steering system. And thanks to Kume and his devotion to catapulting Nissan to the upper echelons, they had the vision they needed to not just make another skyline, but to bring back a legend. I love you, Skyline. All of the pieces were in place. Kume and Nissan had decided that now was the time to revive the sacred GTR badge. It had been 15 years since the silver and red letters had graced a skyline. And with Group A as the target for the next generation Skyline from the outset, Nissan knew exactly what they needed to build. They developed the RB platform into a 2.6 liter inline six. It was a monster of a power plant, spinning two turbos and outputting around 320 horsepower from the factory and soaring to more like six or 800 horsepower on the racetrack. And thanks to the Group A class rules, they knew that the 2.6 liter engine was the biggest engine they could fit into their class and weight was always in mind from the outset. Nowhere was that more apparent than in the interior. It was spartan, it was simple. It's well designed, but sitting on those cloth seats and holding that pedestrian steering wheel, you'd never think this was a halo car. But the R32 GTR was strictly business. You would have thought if you were designing a car to take on the Porsche 928 and the Ferrari 355, you'd make it look just a little bit more exciting than this. Its body design was simple, Aerodynamically, it was an improvement over the boxy skylines of the 80s. 
and they had made panels out of aluminum to stay within the Group A weight target. But visually, it was still a modest car in all regards. Only a small wing and a couple of ducts let you know that this was a performance piece. But underneath that modest outward appearance, spinning beneath the muted gray carpets, laid the secret weapon that was the key to the GTR's success. The Atezza ETS system. Distributing that much power through four rather than two wheels allows the use of radical horsepower. Nissan's engineering team had been paying attention to what was going on in the world of sports cars. To them, Porsche had built the best handling cars on the market, and their 959 was the most advanced road car ever built. So they bought one and tore it to shreds. What they found underneath was the secret to its success its all-wheel drive system. Look, all great art is stolen in some way. If you're not taking cues from the competition, you're not gonna win. So Nissan did exactly that. They employed a similar electrohydraulic clutch to distribute power. But unlike the 959, which always sends power to the front wheels, giving it too much understeer for Nissan's taste, the GTR's all-wheel drive system would only engage the front wheels when the rear wheels lost traction. It utilized computers and G4 sensors to deliver power exactly where and when it was needed. The result was supreme power delivery to the rear wheels, rocketing the GTR down a front straight and giving the car more oversteer, better driving behavior in turns, but delivering unparalleled grip in any situation. It was the best of both worlds. While the RB26 DETT gets all the glory today, it really was this Atezza system that made the GTR special. But not even Nissan themselves could have predicted how this combination of power, technology, and low weight would dominate. In 1990, a GTR pulled up to the start line on a racetrack in Japan. Its competitors are staring at its four round red brake lights. And for years, that's all they ever see of it. The GTR is the most sophisticated weapon yet seen in Group A touring car racing. In sports, rarely are there dominant performances. And when they happen, they make history. Gretzky, Ali, Jordan. But you see, all of them suffered losses. The R32 didn't. For years in Group A, in every race, the GTR crossed the finish line first, leaving the best of Ford, Honda, and Toyota in the dust. Not just taking the top spot, but typically filling the entire podium. For the 29 races in 1990 to 1993, in Group A, driving an R32 was practically cheating. The results cemented Nissan as the performance car king of Japan. It fought off the foreign adversaries that had been making a mockery of them on their home turf. It rebuilt the honor of Japanese motorsport, but it wasn't just Group A. In 1991, it took home the trophy in the Spa 24 hour race. It dominated the Bathurst 1000 in 91 and 92. It went on to champion Group N racing as well. In 1989, Best Motoring set a Nürburgring lap record of 8 minutes and 22 seconds. This was the fastest production car for sale, period. But it was the GTR's performance in Australia that finally earned it the name Godzilla. Godzilla is a funny name. It sounds menacing, brutal. Thanks to the movies, it conjures up images of entire cities being melted with fire. But the word itself means gorilla whale, which come to think of it kind of fits. In the early 90s though, the movie dinosaur was a pop culture icon globally, a sort of mascot for Japan to the outside world. So when the R32 GTR came to the shores of Australia and laid waste to everything it competed against, spitting fire and screaming like a demon, it was only natural that the local Aussie press gave it the nickname Godzilla. In this era of technical one-upmanship between nations, it seems Nissan has outperfected Ford's near-perfect Group A car. The GTR uprooted the reigning king of Australian touring cars, the Ford Sierra. The Sierra had just as much power and weighed less, but it couldn't keep up with the R32 as it catapulted on corner exit thanks to the Atezza system. Godzilla's reign was so supreme that the Australians demanded it be removed from competition, separating it from the Fords and Holdens. Which, yes, this is the key moment that goes on to create the Australian V8 Supercar series. The R32 GTR was finally the true successor to the GTR name, 
not since the 60s had a Japanese car earned so many trophies, had become such a terrifying performer. Kumi and Team Nissan's plan had worked. The 901 movement had done exactly what it had set out to do, create a car that would win on Sunday and sell on Monday. And sell it did. If you're looking to buy yourself the right car from the trophy and mesquite, we're not too far. We got Nissan cars and trucks, so don't be shy. You can buy them from a lady. You can buy them from a guy. From the outset, Nissan knew they had to make 5,000 units for Group A homologation. But not even they could predict the reaction from the Japanese public. The GTR was back, and it was destroying the competition. Everyone had to have one. They blew through those 5,000 examples in mere months, going on to sell over 40,000 R32 GTRs over its production run. Nissan's name had been revitalized. They were now the household name for fast cars from Japan. The 901 movement had created the new twin-turbo 300ZX, a luxurious rocket ship with two turbos and world-beating performance. They had spawned the Nissan Silvia, a lightweight, practical sports car with unlimited potential. The Pulsar GTI-R, a rally-inspired hot hatch that never got the credit it was due. And most importantly, they had created a monster that laid waste to the world stage, that not only rebuilt the reputation of a car company, but of the Japanese automotive industry as a whole. Worldwide, everyone had a new name to fear, and that name was Godzilla. Thanks for watching. Check out my other videos, subscribe, and uh, have a great day, friends. See you in the next one.